Okay, this is our first uh, chapter to look at. This is uh, Introduction, Themes in the Study of Life. And so we're going to be looking at a lot of the basic ideas or concepts of life. Now we have unifying themes here. Uh, the emergent properties. One of the emergent properties means as things become more complex, their chemical and physical properties change. Uh, we'll be looking at one a little in a little bit uh, with chemistry, but just thinking about this, we'll uh, I'll save this till we get to chemistry. The cellular basis of life. The cell is the basic unit of life, and nothing is considered to be living smaller than a cell. Now, cells make up plants and animals. You know, those are pretty big. And then you get to smaller cells like bacteria. And they can, they still uh, are life uh, because of the, uh, the uh, ideas that are around uh, the cell theory that we'll talk about in a minute. Heritable information. Uh, yeah, continuity of life is in, in packed in DNA. So DNA can carry all carries all of our hereditary material, all the information. Each of your cells contains all the information for anything that cell needs or anything that your body needs is found in the DNA of that cell. And that's pretty obvious because of uh, several years ago, they got the nucleus out of a cell of a sheep and put it into an egg, a sheep's egg, and planted that and it developed an entire sheep named Dolly. Relationships between structure and function. There are always relationships between a structure and what its function is. One of the easiest ones to talk about right now would be like um, your ear. Your ear is shaped like a little shell on the side of your head and this function is to capture sound and channel it into the little ear hole on the side of your head. It's called the external auditory canal to make your tympanic membrane vibrate so you can hear. Now you can prove that that's true by putting your hands or cupping your hands outside of your ears and you know that you can hear a little bit better. Interactions with the environment. All organisms interact with the environment. Um, certain animals will seek out shelter instead of being out in the sun. Other ones will be out in the sun instead of being in the shade. Um, if uh, you're driving down the road and you come across a creek and you look out there and you see a log and you see snakes and turtles on top of the log, they're warming themselves up so they can move around in the environment easier. They're cold-blooded organisms. They can't maintain their temperature. So if they can get warmer, they can move better. Enzymes work faster or work better and they can move around in the environment. We uh, interact with our environment outside if it's real sunny. There are several things that we do. We wear lighter clothing. We put uh, sunglasses on to shade our eyes. We put a cap on our head to sh uh, sh uh, protect the top of our head. If it's cold, we put on more clothing and gloves and heavier shoes. So we interact all the time. We have air conditioning inside you know, our, our house, inside of our cars. We have heating in both of those two. So we, we try to regulate our environment so we can, we can manipulate it. Uh, feedback mechanisms. We'll look at those in just a few minutes. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Unifying themes continued. Okay. Uh, unity and diversity of life. Uh, life is very diverse. If you look across the planet, you know, we have oh, elephants, earthworms, crickets, fish, birds, bacteria. We have all forms of life and the unity, the common thread is DNA. DNA is found in all of them and DNA is the hereditary material for life as we know it. Evolution, the word means change. That's all it means. It's called the theory of evolution. Theories cannot be proven. Theories have a lot of data or a lot of things you can look at, but you can't prove it. Um, I, I myself believe in the creation, okay? So you're going to have a hard time getting into an evolution conversation with me. I don't, I'm not going to really do any. But evolution seems to be the core theme of biology. 
No, it means change. That's all it means. When I was in uh, college, I was taking a taxonomy class, and they, the instructor was showing this fish called a coelacanth. And fossil records of the coelacanth exist. And he was saying that this fish gave rise to all these other branches, and they had a little tree there to show that the coelacanth gave rise to all these other fish. Well, then they found a coelacanth in Madagascar. Someone pulled one up from the ocean, just like the fossil records hadn't changed one bit. So what they do is they start changing the taxonomy charts. Okay, it wasn't the coelacanth, it was some other fish that did that. And there are several of ex examples of that that happened. So they didn't change over time, there's just fossils. Now descent with modification means change over, over a long period of time, like millennia. Now in my lifetime, there's been a change. And one of the changes has been that uh, uh, before I was born, antibiotics were used to fight off infections. Well, now we have some antibiotic resistant bacteria, but the fact is they're still bacteria. They haven't changed any. So things can change. It doesn't mean that they change from like an earthworm into a person, a human. Natural selection, uh, we'll see a, a slide or so of that at the end, basically means that uh, if you can't survive in the environment that you're in, that you will die. You have to be able to uh, seek out shelter, food, uh, a mate, you know, that kind of stuff in order to live in an area. If you can't match those things, then you're going to die. You won't live in that area. The scientific process, uh, which we'll also look a little bit later, is a process that um, our uh, scientific community has to go through in order to get things approved for our consumption, like medications. Right now, we have the coronavirus going on, and so we have a lot of different uh, labs around the world undergoing the scientific process to find out what will kill this virus and what are the side effects. Are there side effects that would harm a human if they use this, even though it would kill the bacteria, the uh, virus? Or are there very few side effects and it would still kill the virus? Now, science, technology, and society, this just is implying that over time, things change. Um, I've seen in my lifetime, I saw the, you know uh, Armstrong step on the moon. I've seen the development of from pay phones and house phones to cell phones, which also uh, we can, uh, used to you had to use an operator to call long distance. Now you can call anywhere in the world with your cell phone. Um, you can also use your cell phone as a camera. My son was in China. He did a FaceTime. I could talk to him right there halfway across the world. So there's been a lot of change in medicine. Uh, science and technology has changed a lot. This is a Unifying Themes uh, sheet here, and it, this is what we were talking about earlier. So you can look at this if you want to. And the next one also. This is the second sheet. You see, it goes all the way down to the uh, scientific method, basically. Uh, and that's we talked about that also. Now, emergent properties. Emergent properties of life. Life is very orderly. When you get down to the cellular level, everything is very, very orderly. And everything has to happen in a given order Otherwise, the process doesn't work. When the cell is, needs a molecule, it starts off at the very first and converts you know, the beginning molecule A to B, and then B is converted to C, and C to D, and D to the final product. So it's very orderly. Reproduction, another property of life. There are different forms of reproduction. We will uh, talk about a few. Uh, one is asexual, that means without sex, so there's no gender. This is mainly like, um, oh, protozoans, maybe some bacteria. When they divide, they just divide and produce a clone of themselves. But sexual reproduction has genders. You have a male and a female component, and they produce gametes, which are the sex cells. Females produce ova, males produce sperm, or you can do eggs and plants and pollen, 
in plants, but it's still male and female contributions for the organism to reproduce. Growth and development, this is an easy concept to, uh, to talk about. We are in a, 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 a system, I guess, of growth and development right now. Before you were born, you consisted of an egg and a sperm. When the sperm fertilized the egg, you were now a zygote, a single cell. That cell divided and divided and, and became a fetus, which became a, a newborn. That newborn grew into a toddler, toddler into a youth, then to a teenager, then to a young adult, to a parent, uh, to a grandparent, to a geriatric, and then we die. So that's our growth and development for us, just like any organism on this, uh, or any form of life on this planet. There is a beginning, a development, and an end time. Energy utilization, this implies basically how cells use energy. Cells are very frugal. That means they don't waste energy. When they need to use it, they use it. When they don't need to use it, the process is turned off, and so they can conserve energy. Movement, there is movement inside of cells, inside of plant and animal cells. Uh, you've seen time-lapse photographies probably on TV or the internet of showing a cell divide. And that's over time, so they take a picture every so many minutes or, or so, and you see that things change. Well, the reason they changed is there's movement inside of the cells. There are ways that the cells can move things around, like mitochondria or uh, lysosomes, uh, can engulf material, like your white blood cells can engulf bacteria to kill them. Uh, some, ba uh, some of your white, well, your white blood cells can move around in your body. They can leave your bloodstream and move through your tissues to an infection, to kill the infection. Um, there's movement in plant cells. You wouldn't think that, but there is. Uh, well, you could look on the internet under uh, cytoplasmic streaming in LODA, and you can see the chloroplast, the sites of photosynthesis in uh, plants. You can see them moving around in a circular pattern, and that's done so that they're exposed to light. All of them get exposed to light, and all of them can carry on photosynthesis. Response to an environment, we talked about that just a while ago, how we respond to the environmental conditions by changing our clothing, or you know, our, our glasses on or off, and organisms do the same thing. They seek shelter, or they seek the sun, or something, but they, they can change their environment to where it's uh, convenient for them. Now, homeostasis is the maintenance of a uh, a healthy state, you know, a constant state. Your body tries to stay in homeostasis. It tries to keep you healthy. Um, things that would throw you out of homeostasis would be like stress, a disease, an infection, a cut, a bone break. When those things happen, your body has to repair itself or fight it off, like a bone break. Well, your, your bone, your skeletal system was in homeostasis until you broke that bone. Now your skeletal system is out of homeostasis until that bone break is fixed, and then you return to a state of health. A cut, your, your integumentary system is out of homeostasis in that area, and so your body heals that area, and the skin is healed, and your skin is back in homeostasis. When you have an infection, you go through you know, different things of being uh, sick, nauseated, uh, throwing up, fevers. You're out of homeostasis, and your body is trying to return you to homeostasis. When your body fights off that problem, that let's say that bacterium, it returns you to homeostasis and your body is working correctly again. Evolutionary adaptations. Evolutionary adaptations are gonna be things that can be talked about like, you know, why giraffes have long necks. And they'll say that it's so that they can reach the upper leaves and trees and they don't have to compete with the ground dwellers like cattle and deer that consume the grass and the leaves. Um, your ears, we talked about that, ears uh, are evolutionary adaptations, you could say. Um, some rabbits have big, big ears, they can hear far off. Some have smaller ears, they can still hear, it's just that one hears a little bit better than the other one. Organiza organizational levels. 
And we have a slide that we're going to look at in just a minute that's going to show some of this. So I'll talk about this first. Life is organized on many structural levels, and it is. Now, the organi organismal level of organization starts off at basically atoms that you are composed of. And we'll talk about in chemistry a little bit more about atoms. Each atom on the periodic table has its own chemical and physical properties. Each one does. They're all different. When atoms are put together to make molecules, the molecule does not have the same, some, same chemical and physical attributes as any of the individual atoms that makes it up. It has its own chemical and physical properties. And we'll talk about biological molecules, which are the molecules of life <clears throat> uh, a little bit later. These are the ones that are, there are four of them, that are common to all forms of life as we know it. And these biological molecules make up organelles, which means little organs. These are things like the nucleus, the, uh, you could say the mitochondrion, the lysosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi bodies uh, inside of cells. And so those organelles are parts of cells and cells make up tissues, uh, different types of tissues like bone, or you could talk about muscle tissue. There's three types of muscle, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Um, to make up nervous tissue, epithelial tissues, there's several of those, and connective tissues like bone, uh, cartilage, um, uh, tendons and ligaments, that type of stuff. Those tissues make up organs like your stomach or your brain. Uh, your liver and organs make up organ systems so your digestive system would consist of uh, different parts like salivary glands your teeth your tongue your esophagus your stomach your small intestine large intestine uh, and all those organ systems your respiratory uh, circulatory skeletal and telumentary uh, lymphatic reproductive they all make up the organism so you can see how it goes from the basic, most basic elements of life, atoms, up to the organism. So it is a organismal level of organization. Well, our environment also has levels of organization. A population is a group of like individuals. Like if we were at school, there'd be a population of humans in that room. Well, there's also populations of bacteria in that room. And in the, in the outside the room, there's populations of crickets, populations of flies, populations of birds, populations of trees, different types of trees, different you know, populations of grasses, and so on. All the populations in a given area make up a community, like the community of Irving has populations of humans, horses, cats, dogs, crickets, grasshoppers, birds, trees, grasses, all those things. Um, a community has, is made up of populations in a given area. An ecosystem is a community that can recycle its resources. Like um, we will see a, a picture a little bit later that shows an ecosystem, but um, this is where uh, plants will grow uh, product, like let's say apples, which are consumed by animals in the area. And they use that for building their own body and then they have waste materials that return to the soil that the plants will use again to grow, to produce, um, you know, apples or whatever again. So the resources are circled or cycled in that environment. That's called an ecosystem. Ecosystems remain living as long as they can recycle energy resources like that. A biome is an ecosystem with a specific temperature and plant form. So we talk about like a, a desert biome. A desert biome is, is dry and hot, and the type of plant that it has in there that's predominant is a cactus. Those can live there. You're not gonna find pine trees in a desert. So you look at um, like uh, in the mountains, you know, it's gonna be cold, and you will find some trees that are acclimated to that cold environment, like possibly pines or, or you know, uh, redwoods, something like that. You look at aquatic biomes, we have a Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, Pacific Ocean is cold and the, and the predominant plant life there is algae. The Atlantic Ocean is warmer and the predominant plant life there is also 
algae, but it's a different type of algae. It requires warmer temperatures in the Pacific. The Pacific algae can handle cold temperatures. The biosphere is uh, the zone of life on the planet. It exists from you know several feet above the ground level to several feet below any ground level. Now the ground level could be the bottom of the ocean. There's still life that could exist below that that surface. So the biosphere is where life exists on this planet. Here is this hierarchy of biological order here. It doesn't show the atoms, but you can see that they've been already assembled into the molecules, which have different chemical and physical properties. And the biomolecules are parts of cells that make up the organelles, make up the cells. Cells make up tissues, tissues make up different tissues, make up organs. Organs make up organ systems, and the organism is made up of many organ systems. And you can see he's looking for lunch. The cell, like I told you before, is the structural and functional unit of life. There is nothing considered to be living smaller than a cell. So it is the fundamental unit of life. Now, if you talk about viruses, viruses are non-living. They are not living. They have their own taxonomic area that they're in, and it's non-living because they exist of protein and DNA, possibly RNA. Uh, they don't match the, uh, the cell theory. We'll talk about that later. There are two types of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic, these are going to be bacteria. That's all, all bacteria fall in, under prokaryotic cells. They're very small. And the first thing that, the, that the, uh, any uh, source will tell you about prokaryotic cells is they have no nuclear membrane. That means their DNA is floating around free in the cytoplasm. They have no complex organelles, so they have no membrane-bound organelles. So prokaryotes are bacteria, they're very, they have no nuclear membrane, no membrane-bound organelles, and they're very small. That's why in micro we have to use a microscope to see these bacteria. They're so small, and magnifying them up to a thousand times, we can see them a lot better. Eukaryotic cells have a nuclear membrane. So any cell that has a nuclear membrane is going to be a eukaryotic cell. And they do have complex organelles, which are membrane-bound. They have membranes around them. The membranes uh, uh, make that organelle able to have carry out uh, uh, processes inside that membrane-bound structure that are not found anywhere else in the cell. So the nuclear membrane has the DNA, and that's the only place in the, in the cell that the, that the uh, DNA for the cell is found. And they tend to be kind of large. We don't really need to use uh, oil immersion for those. Eukaryotic cells are animal cells, plant cells, fungi, and protozoans. This is kind of, uh, this slide kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of the size difference between uh, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are kind of like the size of a BB compared to a basketball, a eukaryotic cell being the basketball. Prokaryotes are very small, and so you see that one there, that's a bacterium. You can see the DNA is floating around free in the cytoplasm in there. And this one has a long whip-like structure called a flagellum, which allows it to swim. Now this slide, ecology, these are some definitions. Ecology is the study of the interactions between an organism and its environment. You can take classes on ecology, and they will talk about different organisms and their uh, place in the environment. So uh, these courses uh, are quite extensive, and they, they have food webs and stuff like that. But the study of the interactions between an organism and its environment, what it does in that environment. Producers and autotrophs are the same thing. They're synonyms. So look at the definition of producers. Organisms that produce food in the ecosystem. Those are green plants. They can photosynthesize. They, use, they capture energy from the sun 
and store it in the bonds of that plant. And some of those bonds we can eat, or some of those plant parts we can eat, like fruits, beans, that type of stuff. We'll look at the definition of autotrophs. Autotrophs are organisms that produce food, carbohydrate, from simple uh, compounds and an energy source, the energy source being the sun, photosynthesis by green plants. So autotrophs and producers are the same thing. It's just they're just synonyms for saying the same thing. Now we have another set of terms here. Consumers, look at that, are organisms that feed upon other organisms or their products. Thus they transfer food energy from one level to another in the ecosystem. Well, it's obvious that we are, we are consumers. Uh, we're also heterotrophs. So those are synonyms again. Look at the definition of heter heterotrophs. Organisms that must obtain food from the environment. Thus they are consumers. All right, so we have to, we have to, we consume heterotrophs and uh, autotrophs. Like I said here, consume organisms that feed upon other organisms or their products. And um, heterotrophs means other feeders. We feed on plant and animal material. Now, decomposers are a special type of a heterotroph. Organisms of decay, thus they recycle nutrients within the environment. These are going to be like fungi. When an organism dies, like out in the forest, you see dead trees, you'll see some fungi on them. They, they form little shelves out to the side. And if that, uh, that log has been there for a while, the fungi have decomposed it. And when you step on it, it just decays under your foot. And those elements are being returned to the environment to be recycled by more plant material uh, you know, it's for building plants. Here's an example of an ecosystem here, and of course it's labeled there. And you see that uh, sunlight is the energy source for photosynthesis for this plant. The plant is growing leaves. Now the plant is reflecting heat and is, and is making leaves. The giraffes here are feeding on that. So they're getting chemical energy from the leaves. They're also putting off heat, repairing their body, building their bodies and giving off waste materials. They're going to be returned to the soil uh, by decomposers and reused by the plants. So the energy resources are being recycled in this picture. Here's some feedbacks. Uh, there are two feedback controls that we'll look at. The top one is called negative feedback. Uh, let's look at this one. Let's look at the left hand side first. It shows molecule A is being converted to molecule B, and then B is converted to C, and C to D. And as the levels of D build up, its presence blocks the ability of A to be converted to B, and so it blocks the system. So in high levels of product here, the system stops. As the product level reduces, as that D molecule is, is consumed by the cell and the levels decrease, this will start back up and A will be able to be converted to B, B to C, C to D. And as, as the D production increases, eventually it will block the system again until it uses up the product. Now the example of this in life would be the thermostat on your house. When you set the thermostat, let's say for cooling the house, when it gets too warm, the thermostat kicks on and your air conditioner turns on and it cools the house down. When it gets the house to that temperature, it turns itself off. And it doesn't turn back on until the temperature rises to an inadequate level. And then the thermostat turns back on and reduces the temperature again. That's a type of a negative feedback. And your, your cells mainly use negative feedback in most of the processes. The positive feedback down here is one where, look at the left-hand side again, W is being converted to X, X to Y, Y to Z, and Z makes sure that X is converted to Y so more Z can be produced. So it keeps itself running. Now, positive feedbacks, uh, you have a few of those, and they can be broken. And the only example I can think of on a positive feedback on a human level would be like uh, women nursing offspring. When offspring are nursing, the stimulation of nursing uh, causes the pituitary to release a, uh, a hormone called prolactin. 
Prolactin is a conjunction of two words, promote lactation, and that makes the, the breast make milk. So the female makes milk, and then she nurses again. That stimulation causes the pituitary to release prolactin, and so she makes more milk, and she, she nurses, and that stimulation causes the pituitary to release more prolactin. And that'll keep going until she stops it. And when she stops nursing, the stimulus stops, prolactin uh, release stops, and that process can be stopped. The positives tend to feed themselves. They feed themselves. This slide is up here just to show some uh, diversity. And you can see that uh, this, uh, I guess it's a museum, has a, an area that has flying insects. And they have different types of butterflies here, uh, moths, probably crickets, probably roaches, you know, uh, dragonflies, houseflies. But you can see that, that life is very diverse. And uh, you can just see in the insects, it's very, very diverse. Uh, animal and plants are diverse on this planet, so are in, you know, these insects. And again, the common theme is DNA. Now, there are five kingdoms. I don't have them written down here, but the five kingdoms are uh, Animalia for animals, the kingdom Plantae for plants, the kingdom fungi for fungus, the kingdom protista for protozoans, and the kingdom monera for bacteria. Well, within the last three years or so, um, taxonomists have decided to divide monera into two domains. So above kingdoms now, there is a higher taxonomic level. Uh, eukarya includes all eukaryotes. So that's going to be all animals, plants, fungi, and protozoans are in the domain eukarya. But monera got put into two domains, domain bacteria and domain archaea. Domain bacteria contains all the bacteria that are just normal in the environment. Uh, you know, the ones that cause strep or staph or, um, you know, infections like this stuff or pneumonia, tuberculosis, those are your normal bacteria in the bacteria, the domain bacteria. But the domain archaea, archaea means archaic. These are the, do the bacteria that scientists say were around or produced during the formation of our planet. They're the very first form of life. And these are also called extremophiles because they are lovers of the extreme. Some of these can only grow where it's very, very warm like at Yellowstone, at, uh, at the uh, geysers, it's very hot water there. That's the only place they can grow. There's some that can grow in ice. There's some that can grow in very high salt content. There's some that have to have an anaerobic environment, you know, no air. There's some that have to have an acidic environment or an alkaline environment. So these are the extremophiles fall in the domain archaea. Binomial nomenclature. A man, Carlos Linnaeus, came up with a binomial nomenclature. That means two name naming system. That's what the word means, the two words mean. All organisms have a two word specific name, a genus and specific epitaph is species. Now he did this because people were trying to describe things uh, like trees or plants or life forms. And if they're from different areas of the continent or, or a different continent, they had a different name for that, that organism. And so where it might be like a, a Wheeler oak here, it was a North, North, Elm po uh, North Elm oak somewhere else, or it's a white oak and somewhere else, or Johnson's oak somewhere else. He said, we have to have a way to where scientists around the world know exactly what a person is talking about. So he came up with this binomial nomenclature. Um, the genus is always capitalized, while the, the species is always lowercase, and both are underlined or italicized. Now, Homo sapiens, Homo is capital H, 
and then lowercase omo in this underline. And sapiens is lower s, a-p-i-e-n-s, and it's underlined also. Well, when you take micro, you're going to get into things like Micrococcus luteus, that's a genus and species. Staphylococcus aureus, genus and species. Uh, and here's our Homo sapiens here uh, that he came up with. So he had a very, very huge impact on the scientific community, uh, understanding what everybody was talking about specifically. Now he liked this system that he made up so much that uh, he even changed his own name. His name is Carl Linné, uh, but he calls himself Carlos Linnaeus, like Staphylococcus aureus. So he really got into this. Taxonomy. The taxonomic hierarchy from the highest, most inclusive taxon, that's the collection of life, to the smallest, most specific life form. So we have a group of organisms that share common characteristics. Okay. This is the way that taxonomy goes from the kingdoms. Now, the domain, like I said, is, is new, so it's not on here. But in declension, uh, the kingdom like Animalia, all animal life on the planet. And then it gets more and more specific. Uh, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. This is the declension from the most abundant form of life here, all life on the planet, to the ex exact one down there, the genus and species. And when I was in school, we kept these in order, you know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, by a little mnemonic. And when you make mnemonics, you need to make them easy to remember. Mine was King, Philip, came, over, from, Germany, Sunday. Okay, King Philip came over from Germany Sunday. Here's an example of how this works. If you look at Kingdom of Animalia, you see multicellular heterotrophs. Well, heterotrophs are, are animals, right? All multicellular heterotrophs, all animal life has more than one cell. The phylum is chordata, possess a notochord sometime in their development. This is going to be like a spinal cord with some type of a surrounding covering, like a vertebral column covering your spinal cord. So this is going to knock out earthworms, starfish, jellyfish. Those are not in this group of organisms. Then you get more specific. Class mammalia, mammals. And it says have mammary glands, that's how they nurse their offspring. So that's going to knock out ducks because they are chordata, but they're not mammalia, they're not in the class mammalia. Um, so animals that nurse their offspring, deer, rabbits, um, humans, uh, dolphins, whales, they have hair and three middle ear bones. It's a commonality of this class mammalia. Well, then you get a little more specific order carnivora. These are meat eaters. So that's going to knock out your your deer and your rabbits and your uh, oh well, deer rabbits, what else nurses, uh, you know, cows, this type of stuff. It's meat eaters now. Well, family canidae. These are going to be ones that uh, have dog-like characteristics. You know, have a have four legs, a tail, a snout, the ears, the long body. So this is coyotes, foxes, dogs, jackals, and wolves. Well, in the family Canidae, you have different ones, different genus here. So here's genus. Ooh, Canis. Well, this is only the, the dog ones that are more dog-like. Coyotes and foxes are a little bit different, and you look at their facial structures for sure. And there are a few other differences, but dogs, jackals, and wolves have similarities. So it's going to be the genus is going to be Canis for all these. Canis something. Well, the specific one, the species, is the gray wolf. So it's going to be Canis lupus. Lupus is the species. Which one of those dogs, shackles, and wolves is this? It's the gray wolf, Canis lupus. So we have books that show us how to do this. We're called, they're called keys. You have them for animals and plants and snakes and all kinds of stuff. Here's 
Here's another example. So in the kingdom Animalia, all the different uh, different types of animals. Phylum chordata have, have a uh, vertebral column. Class Mammalia, these are still mammals. Order Carnivora, meat eaters. Family Felidae, these are cats. These are going to be tigers, lions, ocelots, leopards, panthers, this type of stuff. Well, one of these families, there's a genus called Panthera. These are all the panthers. So a Panthera is the genus for black panthers, white panthers, spotted panthers, I don't know, other different types of panthers. And the specific one here is Panthera pardus. The pardus has these spots. So it has like a tawny, like a brown, brownish fur with black spots. That's Panthera pardus. So you know exactly one, which one you're talking about here. Some kingdom characteristics. Characteristics of kingdoms. Monera. Now, mono means one. Now, remember the kingdom Monera is bacteria. So it says unicellular. A few colonial. We don't worry too much about that. Prokaryotic cell type bacteria. Remember, bacteria are the only organisms in Monera. And they do not have any membrane-bound structures. There's the, the DNA is floating around free in the cytoplasm. Now the bacteria, there are two domains above them, bacteria and archaea. The kingdom Protista. These are protozoans. Uh, these are pretty small. Unicellular to multicellular. So some have a single cell, some have several cells. Mostly below the tissue level of organization, so they don't have tissues. Eukaryotic, because all other life is eukaryotic. Monera is the only prokaryotic type of a cell. Protista, those are eukaryotes. So it says uh, unicellular to multicellular. Um, uh, eukaryotic cell type, yeah. Paramecium, amoeba, and algae. You've probably seen paramecium on slides. You may have seen amoeba on a video in algae. Uh, you've, you've probably seen those. If not, look them up on the internet. You can see what they look like. Uh, later on, we'll be divided into several kingdoms in the newest taxonomy. One of the reasons this is happening is that uh, with DNA analysis of all these uh, different organisms, it's getting more and more uh, possible to separate them into something more specific. They have a little bit different DNA, so they, they think, well, they belong in a different kingdom. So they're going to start making up uh, possibly more kingdoms. So it's going to get more diverse than it is right now. The kingdom fungi, multicellular. Uh, these are also, of course, eukaryotic. And it says absorptive heterotrophic nutrition. Absorptive heterotrophic nutrition means that they lay on the surface of what they are, they're eating or digesting. They don't penetrate into the tissue of that uh, organism that they're dieting, that they're breaking down. They have long root-like structures called rhizomes. And these rhizomes will secrete enzymes onto the surface that they're on top of. And those enzymes will digest the surface of the substrate that they're on top of. And then the rhizomes absorb the nutrients from the breakdown of that surface. And then they secrete more enzymes and continue to break the surface down. So they're absorptive. They absorb the broken down materials into their rhizomes. So they have absorptive heterotrophic nutrition. And mushrooms and bread mold are examples. Like you've probably had cheese and you see the cheese has mold on it. The mold is just where you see it. It's not in that cheese. You could cut that piece of the cheese off that has the mold growing on it, and you can eat the rest of the cheese, no problem. There's no mold in it. The kingdom plantae, these are plants, multicellular photosynthetic plants. They use the energy from the sun, capture the energy from the sun to store and to complex carbohydrates. So these are green plants, fall into plantae. Animalia, these are all animals, multicellular, ingestive heterotrophic nutrition. Now, ingestive means that we, that animals take the materials that they are eating into their body. We eat it and we swallow it. So that goes into our digestive system. We ingest it. We take it into our body. 
our body subjects what we've taken into our body to enzymes and acids, and we absorb the nutrients that, uh, from the material that's being digested going through our digestive tract, and then we return what we don't digest to the environment. So we take food into our bodies, that's ingestive heterotrophic nutrition, whereas fungi just absorb what they've broken down on the surface. They absorb those broken down elements into their, into their structure through the ribosomes. I mean, sorry, through the uh, ry uh, rhizomes. So animals, those are and the, and the uh, kingdom animalia. Now, remember it goes kingdom phylum. So let's look at a couple of phylum in animalia. Some of these are, are, are uh, the phyla are easy to explain. Some of them are a little bit harder. The first one, porifera, you know a word that sounds similar to that, porous. So it's called porifera. Now look at the definition there. No tissue or organ development. Porous bodies like sponges. Now you've seen sponges uh, if you've ever been in the ocean or you've seen, you know what sponges are in the, in the grocery store. They used to use natural sponges. You can still buy them, but they're very porous. They have a lot of holes in them. So it's periphera. No tissue or organ development. You've probably seen them uh, break up a sponge into little bitty pieces. And they're all floating around and they reassemble into a sponge. And this next one, if you've taken any foreign language like Latin, you'll know that, uh, or even Spanish, some letters are not necessarily pronounced, even though they're part of the word. Now, this one with the C-N-I-D-A-R-I-A -I -I -A is pronounced Nidaria. The C is silent. Two uh, body layers, they have stinging cells called nidocytes. Jellyfish, if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, they have these nidocytes. Hydra, kind of small, you won't get stung by those. Sea anemones and corals, there's some coral called fire coral. It has a lot of nidocytes, it will light you up if you touch it. Um, these nidocytes are like little harpoons and their toxin is like cobra venom. And what they do is they paralyze their prey. Now you're a little bit big, even though some jellyfish can get huge and they could, they could knock you out. So this is Nidaria. Now, platyhelminthes, look at the definition. Dorsal ventrally flattened bilateral symmetry. Worm-like flatworms. Look up on the internet one called Planaria. P-L-A-N-E-R-I-A. -E now, these are flatworms, um, and they are symmetrical. What's on the left side is on the right side. Now, I kept this one. The way I, I made a new, little mnemonic for this one was, that, see the definition, they're flattened. And platy helminthes, platy, plat sounds like flat. And so I keyed that with flatworms, platy hel hel helminthes. These are flattened like flatworms. Nematodes, I don't have anything for nematode. These are worm-like, so they're cylindrical, body shape, round body shape, complete digestive system. They're round worms. They have a tapered tips on both ends of the long worm. These are the ones, if, you're, if your cat or a dog has ever had worms, these are nematodes. These are round worms. Annelida, annelids, uh, segmented worms, body segmentation, complex organs like earthworms and leeches. They have bands on them. Usually they have rings around them. You know, earthworms do have bands on them. If you've ever been close up with a leech, you've probably noticed that they also have bands on them. And Annelida is segmented worms. I kind of looked at the two ends for being bands that helped me remember that those were segmented worms. Continuing on this, these phyla, mollusca. Mollusca says soft body, usually covered by an external shell. Clams, those have two shells and there's a muscle inside. Snails, they have a shell on the outside and an octopus does have a shell, but it's extremely thin and it's very, very flexible. So have you ever had scallops? Those are mollusca. Oysters, those are mollusca. The, uh, the shell covers the little muscle inside. Arthropita, arthro means joint, pod or Poda means foot. They're joint-footed, 
you know, arthritis has to do with inflammation of the joints. So look at the definition. Jointed appendages, hard exoskeleton. Okay, those are arthropoda. Those are going to be insects like this crabs. Those fall into arthropoda. Shrimp, spiders, insects, even butterflies, they all fall into arthropoda. Ants, they fall into arthropoda also. Echinodermata. Echino means spiny. And derma, like dermis, epidermis, skin. Spiny skin. Spiny skinned animals. They have little bumps on them. They are pentaradial. That means they have five branches from it, from the center of the organism. There are five branches. They have a water vascular system that allows them to move. That's how they walk around. Sea stars are starfish. Sea urchins are the, are the little balls have those long spines on them. And sand dollars, you probably picked up a sand dollar in the ocean. If the sand dollar is fuzzy, it still has its spines on it. If it's smooth, the organism is dead and the spines have fallen off. So they, so look at starfish, they have five arms, because penta means five, penta radial. Sea urchins, if the spines are off, you'll see that there are five branches. In sand dollars, there are five branches on those also. Chordata, they have a, 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 a vertebral column with the nerve cord in the middle. Uh, man, fish, and birds fall into chordata, you know, deer, ducks. They all fall into chordata. They have a vertebral column. Now our natural selection, the production of more offspring that can survive from generation to generation. Well, that probably left a little word out. That can survive. So it's a little, word, a little change the wording there. Production of more offspring. Uh, change it to so that they can survive from generation to generation. Examples of that are like mice and rabbits, cats and dogs. They produce a lot of offspring, you know, more than one. Uh, mice happen to be prey for larger organisms, you know, like uh, cats, let's say. And mice produce a lot of uh, uh, babies so that some can possibly evade predation and reproduce more mice. So that's one of the themes of natural selection, producing more offspring. Genetic variation between all members of a population. There's a lot of genetic variation in any group of organisms, any population. If you look at humans, there's a lot of variation there. You look at height, you look at um, uh, arm length, finger length, uh, eye shape, nose shape, skin color, chin shape, ear shape, hair color, eye color. There's, lots, there's a lot of variation between all members in a population. So variation gives, um, uh, it contributes to survivability. Competition for survival. You're competing for resources. Remember, uh, food, shelter, and a mate. That's part of natural selection. If you can't uh, do that, then you're going to be weeded out of the population. Also, you see uh, natural selection examples on, on the news or on, on National Geographic, and it shows like a lion looking at a herd of zebras, and they're looking for the ones that they can tell are damaged or too small to outrun them, and those will be gleaned out of the population. And so that's natural selection. Differential survival and reproduction, that kind of gets into the last two we talked about, about uh, finding a uh, uh, place to live, food, and being able to reproduce, finding a mate. If you can't do that and you can't live in the environment, then you're not going to uh, live in that. You'll be naturally selected out of that environment. Here's an example of natural selection by the shell color of these little beetles. It says populations with varied inherited traits. So some of them have darker shells, some have light shells. Well, this bird can see the light shell one's pretty easy against the background. So elimination of individuals with certain traits. In this case, the ones that have the lighter colored shells are easier to spot. Uh, reproduction of survivors, you get down to the end. The increasing frequency of traits that enhance survival and reproduction, reproductive success. Uh, you can re reproduce or survive longer if you have a darker shell. And so that is the predominant gene in that population now because the lighter colors have been thinned out. Not that they're still not there, but there's not as many. Here's some uh, other examples. This seahorse lives in 
some algae that look just like its extensions off of the seahorse's body. They blend in almost perfectly. And you see this little, little bird here sitting on a, a, um, a little chipped stone or whatever uh, area, and it's going to be hard to see it because its feathers are colored and patterned the same way as the gravel that it's sitting in. And deer, the little does, they're light brown, have spots to help them blend into the forest a little bit better. You've probably seen rabbits that you've walked up and you startled a rabbit and it goes, or a bird, they go flying off or running off. You never even saw them because they blended so well into the environment. So that helps for natural selection also. The scientific method. Well, we're doing a lot of stuff right now in science, and the scientific method goes, this is like your science fair project. You define the problem. What is it right now? Uh, let's say that you have something that's killing plants. You study the problem. You see how that plant is affected. What's, what's What part of that plant is affected, and what is it doing to kill that plant or reduce its output? And you form a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess. I think what's causing this is, you know, too much sun. And so you, you, too much sun is your single variable for your experiment. You have one that's in the shade, one that's inadequate, you know, sun, and one that's in a lot of sun. So you have, you, you're dealing with the sunlight exposure. You observe the results and collect the data. Was it sunlight that did it? You say, well, no, they died in all those situations. Well, then your conclusion was, my hypothesis was wrong. It was not the amount of sunlight. It needs to be something else. So you formulate a different hypothesis. Maybe the amount of water in the, in the soil. Maybe the, the pH of the soil. Maybe an insect. But you have to go through each, um, each hypothesis has to be conducted and see uh, what the conclusion is. So this is what takes science so long sometimes to come up with a medication that we can get. Because some of them work, but they have certain side effects that are not good. So yeah, it worked, but that's not gonna that's not gonna be used because it has bad side effects. Let's find something else. So they formulate another hypothesis with a different chemical and do the experiment again. How does this relate to theories and scientific laws? Well, remember I told you theories, if they are concepts considered as a truth in science. There's a lot of data, but they cannot be proven. You can't prove it. We have a lot of fossils, but there's still some organisms alive that are also in the fossil record. So it's still called the theory of evolution. It can't be proven. Now, scientific laws can be conclusively proven to be true. There are, are methods of proving them through experiments and or math uh, for determining it is a scientific law.